Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this conference. We're live with, from the European Parliament, but joined by an amazing lineup of speakers from all across the world. Today, we're going to be talking about local communities and their role in supporting sustainable development. And we're going to be talking about the need of a shift in our economic model from the way that we've been doing things up until now to a circular economy. With the pandemic, we have experienced an important shock, and we wonder whether we need uh, to have a shift in the way that we consume, in the way that we produce to make sure that we keep uh, our climate safe, that we uh, protect our environment. We're, all, we're going to be talking about that and we're going to be talking especially about the role of local communities in making sure that we can achieve this change. I don't know if you know, but 92% of the resources that we use to produce, they are only used once and then they go to waste. We're going to talk about how we can transform our economy to make sure that we reuse, that we recycle and therefore that we protect the environment, our nature, our planet to make sure that we have a more sustainable growth. And we're going to be talking about all those issues in the context of the Global Progressive Forum. So I would like to jump straight away into the conversation, but I want you to know that you too can be part of this conversation. So first of all, you need to know that we're live on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, all of the accounts of the Socialist and Democrats groups in the European Parliament. So make sure that you tune in. If you want, you can share that, those links with all of your colleagues to make sure that they too can watch us live. We're also live on the website of the Socialist group, uh, socialistanddemocrats.eu, and on the website of the uh, Global Progressive Forum as well. So again, make sure that you tune in. And if you would like to ask questions, we're going to have an amazing team monitoring all your comments, ideas, and questions in uh, Facebook and and on Twitter as well. And you can use the hashtag GPF, so Global Progressive Forum 2021. We definitely want to hear from you. I will be keeping an eye on all those questions coming, but let's jump straight away into the conversation. And for that, I would like to introduce Andrea Snyder, who is a uh, member of the European Parliament, and he's also co chair of the Global Progressive Forum. So tell me a little bit, Andreas, what is the Global Progressive Forum, and why are we here today to discuss the local contribution uh, to a more sustainable world? Uh, as you mentioned, uh, like 92% of, of all the world resources are thrown away after once being used. It's showing that we have a global reason to discuss global issues. Something is going wrong on our world. And the idea of the Global Progressive Forum is to have a progressive debate globally, not only European, not only socialists and social democrats, but globally with NGOs, with people from the university, with youth organization, with trade unions, with politicians, of course, and, and, and others, researchers, to discuss what could be a, a step forward in, in the global approach. And the GPF will end up in a big global progressive forum, which will take place in, in the end of November, 17 to 19 of November here in Brussels, but also in other places. And until then, we will organize a lot of webinars and discussions under several umbrellas and several topics, like today. Uh, it's showing also that, for example, the question of environment, resources, how we deal in the world is also linked with human rights, but also with our local communities. So I'm looking forward for a thrilling debates on this issue. Absolutely. A lot of different uh, policies and a lot of different sectors are interacting between each other, but also the need to involve everyone in this conversation because we have to join forces if you want to protect climate change. Uh, and because we want to join forces, we're going to talk about businesses and their role in contributing to this fight. And for that, I would like to welcome Gunter Pauli, who is an economist and the author of Blue Economy. And Gunter, I would like to ask you, uh, you have introduced this concept of blue economy that draws inspiration from um, the protection of natural ecosystem to solve economic and social problems. How does it benefit local economies and how does it work in practice, this blue economy? You know, ecosystems only work locally. Ecosystems don't work globally. An ecosystem takes care of particular conditions that are determined by geography, that are determined by proximity to the ocean, to the mountains, etc. But what we have to urgently do is stop talking in general terms and move to very practical things. For example, in a local community, when you're drinking coffee, then the waste of the coffee should be converted to a mushroom. The mushrooms, once they are harvested, they leave amino acids behind. Great nutrition for the chickens. So when I have coffee, I actually have mushrooms and I am having chickens and the chickens will lay me eggs. 
And this has a major economic effect. One of the greatest dramas of globalization is that it takes cash out of the local economy and puts it in that global sphere. We need cash to circulate in the local economy so that people have what we call as economists the multiplier effect. When money circulates locally, then there is much more growth in that local economy and many more products that can be sourced locally in order to respond to the basic needs. Absolutely. But I was wondering, because you mentioned, of course, that ecosystems are local, but some of the issues that are affecting those ecosystems know no borders. I was wondering, how do you reconcile these supporting local economies while at the same time tackling uh, global issues such as climate change to make sure that you protect those communities as well? Get to be realistic. Macroeconomics is the amalgamation of microeconomics. If you want to change the macro, you got to change the micro. There's no way to go around it. And therefore, we're looking at hundreds of communities where we are taking the priorities of the communities. For example, today, if we're looking at coastal zones, number one problem is massive unemployment due to this complete stoppage of, uh, of tourism and economic activities along the coasts. So we needed to address not just the economic issue of can we give value to local products, but at the same time, we needed to generate enough value added so that we can pay for people to get onto the job. And this combination of having an ecological solution while generating jobs is what we're doing when we take the example of the regeneration of the seaweed forests, which are massive captures of carbon dioxide, safe havens for juvenile fishes of the species that have been overfished. And at the same time, while you're having these massive uh, forests of algae in the ocean, you can harvest 50% of that and generate biogas, which we're doing in Morocco, which we're doing in Colombia and Indonesia, so that we're able to provide carbon neutral gas. Instead of shipping gas from Qatar or from Algeria or Russia to any other part of the world, we need to find local sources for local solutions that directly contribute to global issues. Local solutions to global problems, definitely something that I want to uh, ask to uh, the rest of our speakers. We're going to keep on uh, going. And now I would like to introduce Sunita Narain, who is an Indian environmentalist and author, and is the Director General of the Indian-based Research Institute Center for Science and Environment and the editor for uh, a magazine, Down to Earth. Um, Sunita, I know that um, this issue is very close to your heart, that for you, the uh, defense of the um, environment is part of ensuring the livelihood of poor people in countries that are uh, in, in difficulties, especially in India, for instance, and, and all around the world. And I was wondering, how do you see that uh, circular economy could contribute to both protecting those environments while at the same time supporting development uh, in those uh, developing uh, areas? Um, thank you. And uh, I think what Kunta has said, let me add to that. I mean, as we see it, uh, today we have a real, we have a huge challenge on our hands. On one hand, we have the massive challenge of poverty, um, huge amount of impoverishment of large numbers of people. Because you cannot hear me? Uh, yeah, sorry, just go ahead. I, I'm just having a, an, an issue with my earpiece, but you can go ahead, no worries about that. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, so as I was saying, I think you know, today we are in this very, uh, fair, you know, it's a very tough time in the world. On the one hand, we have huge impoverishment of local economies. Everything that we talk about, actually the poor are getting poorer. We are seeing their resources getting drained out. We are seeing their knowledge, their understanding of the reuse of resources. I mean, if, if you would once consider the fact that poor of the world actually live already in what we call today a circular economy. It's just that they don't call it a circular economy. They call it frugality. They call it poverty. Economists call it poverty, that you're reusing everything. 
because you have to do so. But on the other hand, our economy is under huge challenge today. Huge challenge. We are seeing massive impoverishment of our rural areas, of the poor in the world. And on top of that, we are seeing the challenge because of climate change. We are seeing now extreme weather events. We are seeing more and more um, cyclones. We are seeing floods. We are seeing droughts. Uh, and as a result of the coping ability of the poor is really um, under assault. And we have to understand that each natural disaster is not the end of it. It takes away people's ability to be able to survive. And that's really what we are seeing more and more. And I think that's where we need to situate the post-COVID world in terms of where we go ahead. On the one hand, we need to recognize the need to build resilience and invest in rural economies, invest in the economies of people, which we have not done adequately till now. Uh, very much like Gunta said, um, there are many options of building local livelihoods, of building local businesses, of building ways in which people find employment closer to where they live. And that's really got to be one part of the huge resilience opportunity that we have. And that's also because if you look at COVID, one of the, uh, uh, one of the uh, issues with COVID has been, in fact, the feedback from COVID has been that very large numbers of people are going back home and going back to their villages. And this is really where the opportunity is for investment into rural economies, but investment with a difference, not investment in a way in which we drain the resources out of the rural economy, but that we invest in both the labor, the knowledge, and the resources so that we can build resilience. I also want to add another issue in terms of the urban economies of the world, because one of the other uh, issues that we are learning today is that the poor are not wasteful because they are poor. But as they get richer, societies get richer and more affluent, they get more wasteful. And that's where the whole issue of single use I think we lost you, Sunita. I'm going to, yeah, we lost you. So okay. we're, I, we can hear you now. We can hear you now. You're back. <laughs> <laughs> My network is fine. So I don't know what's happening. I can see. Um, OK, let me just make my two short points. I just wanted to end by saying, when we are looking at the local community issue, because that's what we are discussing today, there are two other issues that we must bring in when we look at the circular economy that we are trying to build. One, it is in my world, and I'm sure we will hear from Colombia as well, from Bogota as well, but in Delhi or in Bogota, it is the poor communities who actually are involved in all the recycling businesses that we discount so much today. And that we need to be able to invest on those businesses and invest in those livelihoods and not negate them. But they work in very bad conditions today, and that's where our opportunity comes, to improve the conditions, but not remove the livelihoods. And this is also where local communities play a very big role in terms of saying, not in my backyard. Because when more and more local communities say, not in my backyard, can you make a landfill site, you end up with reinventing the waste systems of the world. And that's where the big, so deepening of democracy, looking at livelihoods as the opportunity for circularity in the economy. Those would be my three big things. Thank you so much, uh, Sunita, for that, because indeed I think you point on very important, really talking about the need to make our economies more sustainable, but also to ensure labor's rights, as Andreas was saying before, all these different issues are actually interlinked, and we, we need to make sure that when we tackle uh, the, the need for a more sustainable economy, we also take people on board. And the question of resilience, indeed, because of the impact of climate change, those are oh, those are questions that I'm going to be discussing later with our, uh, with our um, speakers, indeed. I would like to move now, because you mentioned, indeed, we have Carolina Urrutia-Batket with us, 
She is the Environment Secretary of the city of uh, Bogota in Colombia. And I would like to hear from her perspective as a local representative in an emerging economy, how does um, the question of involving a more uh, circular economic model um, in the way that uh, you apply your local policies in government? So I think Sunita made a couple of really good points in terms of putting together and connecting the rural and the urban in these huge challenges that we have towards a circular economy. Of course, what she says is perfectly true. It, the, the, most, the poorest communities in the world are those that already have been using, that never left the circular economy, and we have a lot to learn from them. But as she says, as they become more urban and perhaps have more resources, these customs tend to change very rapidly. In Bogota, what we're doing is working sort of on three fronts. Our mayor, Claudia Lopez, has been very insistent that we need a major change of habits in every single aspect of our lives, individuals, organizations, and of course, coming from public policy. And we're focusing our, our circular economy strategy in a wider green growth strategy, bringing the city towards opportunities involving growth in sectors that uh, have the least impact on climate change and a key issue for biodiverse countries such as Colombia, uh, markets that tend to uh, be elements of conservation of our biodiversity. We have to recognize uh, in a more straightforward manner that biodiversity is one of the main opportunities that Colombia has in international markets. And that's what we've been working on, on strengthening those links between, between the rural and the urban. And also, of course, working on this. This is an 8 million person city which hu with huge solid waste management challenges. Waste management is the, our third contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. And despite the fact that we, we've had um, significant advances in terms of social policy, Sunita mentioned recycling and the way some of the most vulnerable groups in our society are those who have worked in recycling over the decades. In Bogota, fortunately, they have been recognized in the waste management tariff. So uh, once our, our recycling communities get organized, they can receive uh, money from what every household pays. But we have huge um, policy challenges that remain. We still don't have a way to have the tariffs, what, uh, uh, how we are charged our waste management uh, expenses to recognize when we do a better job of recycling. And that's one of the main challenges that we're working on with the national government. We need to have economic incentives in our tariffs, in the way we pay for our public utilities, for recycling and for better use of our resources. And that's true also for water, even though, of course, spending less money on water is always recognized in, in our tariffs. Recycling is very hard, and we are trying to make a, that recognition in, in the way we pay for our public utilities be a big part of the urban agenda. But we also have to work with what you mentioned, the private sector, giving them knowledge and incentives and the connection to the academic sector and what, what is going on with science, technology and research so that there are more opportunities uh, in terms of new business development that recognizes not only the circular economy, but also the opportunities in the bioeconomy, which is certainly a big part of Colombia's future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that, because indeed you bring together all the different aspects of this discussion, how we need to uh, make sure that uh, we have a comprehensive policy for national, global, European, uh, in, in our case, but also a Latin American level, uh, reconcile with the local uh, solutions to make sure that we tackle the issues that affect the most of the people, but while at the same time we involve all the different sectors from policymakers, citizens, and so on. And I would like to touch later upon the question of how we make sure that we protect uh, the rights of those communities that have been actively uh, uh, working on recycling, um, but that has been somehow left aside for a very, very long time. But they have been very much part of the solution, indeed. Um, I would like to move back to Europe now, um, and I would like to introduce Paul Magnet, who is the mayor of Charleroi. Uh, Charleroi is a city that has been very much affected by this industrialization. How do you see this new green economy, and in particular a circular economy, as an opportunity for growth in your town? It's a great opportunity, not just for growth, of course. It's one of the sectors which has produced uh, lots of jobs, and including uh, jobs for low-qualified people. So it's very important in terms of social inclusion. But I think the most 
important and the most difficult challenge uh, we face in, in this uh, transition is to make the transition towards a circular economy, and I would say a circular model in general, exciting. It's very easy, I mean, to know how we can replace individual cars with buses or bikes, for, for example. But in cities where people do like to take their, their cars, it's a very difficult transition and you, you get many negative reactions. We also know that we have to uh, uh, reduce uh, urban sprawl and make sure that we rebuild the city on the city and have more density. But again, many people would like to have their individual house with their individual garden and so on and so forth. And so the European way of life, uh, inspired by the American way of life, is so deeply embedded in, in our mentality that it's very difficult to to convince people to change their habits and they see it as a, as a limitation, they see it as a constraint and if they see it as a constraint, it will not be popular. So you, you need to change uh, the, the perception of what it means to become, to go circular, if I may say, uh, in those words. And this is the reason why, for example, we use a project with, uh, connected to food, because food is always very important. Food is 25% of uh, GES emissions uh, in the world, so it's a major challenge in terms of uh, global warming. Uh, it's a very important economic sector too. It's also very important for our health. If we eat good food from the very first month of our life, we will have a, a good health. Otherwise, we will have obesity and many other uh, society illnesses, as people say. So it's a very a key challenge. And uh, it's, it's the kind of things that can make, I think, transition popular. We, in, in our cities, for example, convince all the schools, all the restrooms, all the hospitals to uh, build together a major collective kitchen. We decided we would produce at least 30,000 meals a day for kids in the schools, in the nurseries, but also for elderly people who live at home or who live in restrooms, but also for ill people who are in hospitals, so people who are very vulnerable, who need a very, uh, very good quality food. And we decided that 100% of the ingredients that we will use to produce those meals would be organic and local. And we give ourselves five years to do that, so it's a huge challenge in terms of organization, but it's also very, very exciting because the city talks again with the, all the other municipalities around where we have, have lots of farmers and say, well, that's an opportunity for me to sell my, uh, to, to move from uh, industrial crops to uh, new organic vegetables and to find a market and to find, and to find a customer a public customer, it's a good opportunity to create jobs in all those sectors and also to give high quality food uh, with low emissions or carbon neutral emissions to the kids, to the elderly people, to the ill people and say it's good food and, and, it's, and, and you, have to, you have to eat three times a, three times a day. As, as, uh, as uh, Woody Allen said, there are three <laughs> very important questions in life. Where do we come from? What will be the, the future of the world? And what do we eat tonight? And, <laughs> and this third one is, is, is very important in our everyday life. So if, we can, if you can show with very concrete examples to people that this will improve your life and this will improve the, the quality of the environment and this will also reduce the level of GES and, and, and another all other things and we will reuse all the ways to produce energy or to re-fertilize the grounds where other crops will be will be produced it can become exciting and then you stop seeing it as a constraint which limits your freedom or forces you to change your way of life and you see it as something which makes your life more interesting Absolutely, and I think it's important that that push comes from the public uh, sector, from the public government indeed, to create that area, that place where actually those markets can actually grow. Um, I, was, I was going to go back to Zunita because you mentioned the question of the European way of life. Um, Carolina was talking about the change of behaviour that we need to see in our society. And I know that Zunita feels that uh, the, um, the most developed countries, the, the industrialised countries, have an especial responsibility to make sure that our way of living is actually sustainable. So how do you see all these, uh, these changes that we are seeing in a number of countries in trying to become more sustainable, but also the resistance that we are facing uh, from some citizens towards those changes? No, I think, you know, it's a, as I said, we are in a very, very tough time. And, uh, um, and the fact is that we do need to change and the change will have to come from the richer societies, partly because they are just such massive users of resources. I mean, if every Indian wanted to live like a European or every Indian wanted to live like an American, we would need 
how many countless planets. We know that. I mean, we just cannot afford that lifestyle. But it is also the fact that it is very aspirational. I mean, um, if, if we in India or in other parts of the world, when we look forward to, as we talked about this, that as the poor get richer, they get more wasteful because that's the kind of role model that they see that it's, a, you know, you have to use more resources, you have to buy a lot more, you have to discard a lot more, and that becomes part of the economic model. And I think this is where there is also the opportunity of what I just heard, which is, you know, remarkable because as cities reinvent themselves, as cities rethink about their option for the future, and looking very deeply at how they can integrate both sustainable living, but also the livelihoods of very poor people, I think that's really where the role models become you know, easier to emulate. It's easier for us all in the global community to talk about these, but we need to do them at scale and we need to do them fast. And I think that's where my concern is, not the fact that we do not want to change, but that the change is coming too slow, given what we know is happening today with climate change, given today the, the fact that we know we have to make a transformation in our mobility systems, in, in the way we use resources, I think we need to scale up these responses as well. Absolutely, and it's very important to indeed build trust uh, with citizens to make sure that they are on board and that they are part of the solution as well. We hear from Paul what they are doing in Charleroi. I was wondering, Karina, how are you trying to change that behavior of citizens in Bogota to make sure that they are also part of the solution? Well, I think, first of all, we do have to recognize, as Sunita mentioned, that the economic impact of COVID eh, and the fact that we've lost here in, in Colombia, we've lost around 20% of our jobs. And we're going to be a lot slower to recover. Uh, the, the recovery of these economies that have gone back 10, 20 years in the alleviation of poverty agendas across the region is not going to take a few months the way it is in some countries in Europe or in the United States. We're not going to see that resilient uh, recovery as quickly. So we do have to take this into account. We have, in Bogota, we had a very ambitious climate change agenda, a very ambitious um, technology transition agenda with both the private and the, and the public sector. And we are having to be a lot more understanding about the fact that people just don't have a lot of money to invest right now. So we're having to look into alternatives. Where is the money for our big technological transition going to come from? And we are focusing, as you very well mentioned, on while we figure this huge economic uh, problem, this huge economic situation out, we are calling for individuals to harness the power of their own transition and of their own recovery. And we've focused probably on three main things. The first one is changing the way we move. Bogota has um, created 85 kilometers of new bike lanes across the city for people to get around during the COVID pandemic. And now, of course, as we slowly uh, recover from the pandemic, these are still in use as a means for people to change the way they go about transport in the city. But that was a very early uh, bicycle promoter. We've had our bike lanes for 20 or 30 years. And this investment has probably been a uh, very important, not only for clean transportation, for all, but also for health, as people were initially very hesitant to get back into public transport. The second is focused on waste management. As I mentioned, um, the third source of greenhouse gas emissions in Bogota are from uh, bad practices in our solid waste management, particularly in organics, um, Latin America in general, and of course, Bogota is, as one of our main cities. We've been very slow to integrate a organic um, use of organic materials into our waste management system. And now we're, we have four big pilots trying to get our organic waste out of the landfills because that's a huge waste of resources. And probably the third, we're lucky enough in our city to be working on our land use plan at the moment. And what we're doing is um, being a lot more consistent and demanding a lot more from our, our from new constructions in terms not only of energy management and of energy efficiency, but just 
water waste management, the way Bogota is, it, it rains a lot in Bogota. People usually don't know this. It's expected to be a very tropical city, but sometimes we're more like London than like Delhi. And so how we manage water and how we put it back into the soil and the way we've been in, you know, wasting this water in the past is being very seriously integrated into our land use plan to make sure that all new constructions are, are very wise to use um, their natural resources. And of course, promoting more green areas. The more green areas in our cities, the better. This is a huge challenge for cities such as Bogota that grow exponentially. And it's at the contrary to what's happened in India, probably Sunita, in Colombia, we're seeing more people move to cities because of the medical care. So um, we're not seeing the same migration patterns across the world. And these, these three issues are probably what we're focusing on right now. And of course, the creation of green jobs. We're looking at this, the few, one of the few things that is an opportunity in this tremendously challenging situation is for us to rethink how we're going to recover this economy. Right now, even from our environment secretariat, we are working on the creation of green jobs, just on the greening of the city, of public gardens, of taking care of our trees, of planting uh, the forests around the city. And these are, you know, uh, low skilled jobs that will help uh, people get out of the immediacy of the economic crisis. They are, of course, not structural solutions for unemployment in our city, but I think every, and the mayor thinks, that every single thing we can do at, at this juncture to create employment and even a condition monetary transfers is going to be a huge Absolutely. opportunity. I, I wanted to, uh, to point to you because Paul, I've been seeing that you were nodding and reacting very strongly to ca what Karina has to say. Are you getting ideas from, uh, from Bogota about how we can make our cities more greener also in, in well, Europe? I'm, I'm I would say many things that are done in very huge cities like Bogota or in middle cities like, like mine are universal needs of cities. We all need more public transportation. We all need to be much more demanding vis-a-vis -vis all people who build uh, new buildings to make sure that they, are, they, they use much less energy and that we, we recycle water, that sort of things. We all need more trees. I would fully agree with this. And this is a major, this is a major challenge, not always because not only because nature, it's been demonstrated by the wealth uh, organized, the World Wealth Organization, nature is a key factor for personal well-being, but also for public health. Mm. And trees in cities, cities will be uh, ever more exposed to a very big heat in the summer. And so we need trees everywhere. And to make sure that we, we see a city not as a, as a, as a sort of artificial uh, island within the nature, but we see it as a landscape where and, and where human beings live in that landscape. So we, we need to rethink uh, the nature that existed before the city was there and try to see how can we give it its rights back. For example, we've uh, everywhere we had lots of small rivers in the city. We, we've hidden them because it was not very practical. So we, we can now try to reopen them to replant trees and, and different kind of plant, plants along those, those, those rivers. And so to give a place to give a, to give a place back to, to the nature within the city. That's very important. We saw also under the COVID crisis all those wild animals that were coming back <laughs> to the cities. They say, well, I mean, we are part of nature, and this is a, a bit of nature. We've forgotten it because we see it as something which is the city is the culture against the nature, against the forest, and that sort of things. No, we part of nature, and nature needs to be reinforced within the city too. It's very important in terms of protecting the bio, biodiversity and also creating sort of a small oasis of uh, of a cool in cities that will be uh, ever hotter in, in, in the summer with, with all the consequences that can Indeed. have on, on public health. I wanted to get back to Gunter on this question of making sure that nature is part of the solution as well. We have been talking for a very long time today about the impact of COVID for our economies and the opportunities as well that that might bring. How do you see a bluer or a greener economy being part of the solution to make sure that we have a more sustainable growth in the coming years? Look, the most important thing that I see is that we need a dramatic shift in the business models. If we're going to keep on doing business the way we've been doing business in the past, we're going to keep on staying stuck with the problems Bogota, Mumbai, or the villages are facing. I'll give you a concrete example. If you want to take care of organic waste, the bio component of the solid municipal waste, then 
there is no other way than to check where is the revenue generation. We can't keep governments to keep on subsidizing and paying because they're overstretched with debt. Bogota is heavily indebted. Colombia is at the edge of its debts. So we need to find business models whereby we generate revenue. Concrete example, if you are taking the organic waste, solid municipal waste, and you are mixing this with the wastewater treatment plants, then you would have a massive increase of the potential of uh, biogas production, which is so critical in getting our climate uh, change mitigation programs implemented. Now, the problem is that Bogota, like Medellin, like Mumbai, like Brussels or Charleroi, they have all said that water treatment is for water treatment companies and waste management is for waste management companies. Well, I can tell you, we have now seven cities around the world where the organic waste management of the solid waste and the waste water treatment is combined. And today, these seven cities, they generate so much biogas and so much revenue that they are paid by companies to be able to offer that service. You heard me. They're being paid to offer the service. But I know the nightmare it is legally to force the water company, the wastewater treatment company, to work together with the solid municipal waste company. There are two different worlds. Now, if we are not prepared to change the business models, then we're going to get stuck very heavily. Second thing is that, uh, give me the example of plastics versus glass. You know, this is a huge issue. Um, Peldar in Colombia and others around the world, they started refusing recycling glass because the price they could get was too low and it was cheaper to use virgin glass. As a result, plastics were being used. And so cities are overloaded with uh, the plastics. So what are we seeing today? We have 11 factories in Europe where the glass is recycled, but not again into a glass bottle, but the glass is recycled into building materials. These building materials were first approved in Sweden. Now across Europe, all the countries are approving glass foam as a construction material, much more cheap than the cement and the concrete, but it is also sequestering carbon dioxide instead of emitting it. Now, since we are using glass as a bottle and then we're using glass as a building material, the glass is cheaper when you combine both functions. And to me, these are the kind of very concrete examples most governments are having difficulties with because it's a change of the business model. The plastics lobby is so forceful in most of the countries that this shift can only come when the elected officials make decrees and enforce this change. Switzerland is an excellent example because Switzerland has obliged 100% recycling of all uh, glass bottles, which meant that immediately through the construction of uh, buildings with glass foam as a recycled, it generates so much additional revenue while being more competitive. I can go on for days <laughs> with it. Um, but you were mentioning... We need to change the business model and the legal framework to create this business model needs to be put in place and that creates a lot of courage. And I was going to turn to Andreas for that one because I want to know what can policymakers do to create that environment where business models can change and actually be part of the solution? Uh, this is this is the big question because there is a lot of, of course, a lot of issues with where we have to touch. It's coming from how we organize global trade policy. I think there is a lot of what could be done differently like we do now. Uh, when you speak about system change, of course, cities, 
local communities are also the, the place where a lot of change can be put in practice. Like, for example, we spoke about to rethink mobility. It's not about having a car as your second identity. It's more of having a mobility in the sense of to move from A to B. And there is a lot of system. There's underground buses, bikes, car sharing. So it's not owning, it's more sharing. Uh, cities could be, for example, organizing the heating system collectively in this uh, uh, centralized, not in the building centralized, but in the whole city centralized heating or centralized cooling, maybe for the, for the futures. Uh, we spoke about rethinking food. It's not of getting uh, stuffed every evening. It's about having some, some enjoyment, but also something healthy, and also maybe taking in consideration how it is produced, also quality and how it is produced has some interlinkage. So we speak, and I think this is what Paul said before, it is not about putting new limits to the life of the people, it's about improvement of life quality. This means change, and of course change never is easy, therefore <laughs> need, needs also political decision to be taken and to explain why. So uh, I think what, we, what the examples we have is now that in some cities you can show you have an impact and then of course people are fed up and saying why I lose a, a lane for my cars. But then maybe two weeks later they discover, hey, but now the air is better, the traffic is more calm, people are more on the and bike. you're right, if I can jump on this, yeah. the, the dynamics is very important, the dynamics of change. Very often I see that in, in my city, you start changing things, people react very negatively because they know what they have, they don't know what they will have, they're against all the negative consequences of the change that, that you make. Then they start realizing, well, it gets better. And then say, well, not only are we okay with what we change, but we want more of it and faster. And then you have sort of twice... Uh, unhappy first because it changes and then because it doesn't change fast enough. <laughs> but I mean, the second reason why they're unhappy is, is very good. I mean, because it's, it supports the dynamics of change. So you have to have to live with, first we need quite long term, not too long, because we only have 25 years to make the world carbon neutral. <laughs> we but uh, we, we need to have spans of times of five years or something like that, say this, is, this will be done in five years and then have a lot of, lot of public debate with the people to say, well, yes, of course, we will have this, but uh, as a negative consequence, but this is what you will get as, as an advantage at the end of the process. And these dynamics, when people start saying, ah, indeed, I, th I, I see that things are getting better and that uh, the society is improving, then they become advocates of the change themselves and it can fasten the, 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 the process of change. Then for that, we need boldest governments. I, I was wondering, Carlina, how do you see these? Because you were talking about these collaboration between uh, local governments and businesses, organizations uh, within Bogota. How has been your experience? Can a local government contribute to change an environment in which it is easier to contribute to these solutions? I think we definitely can. Taking into account that businesses in Bogota, 85% of them are small to medium businesses. And we do have the larger ones that have already, of course, many of them embarked upon huge transitions in terms of how they use natural resources and how they manage their energy efficiency. What we're trying to work on from our corner is trying to create a, a bonds between these large companies that already have good practices and having their um, having them um, sorry my having them hire these smaller companies so that we have them sort of linked and pushing towards transition. But I am afraid of one thing that I have to say that because. Uh, this sort of populist movements in Latin America are talking more and more about deprivatizing all companies. And I do think there's a very important match between how business, Gunther was mentioning it very well. Many of the most, um, of the fastest and most daring transitions in terms of sustainability are coming from the private sector. Not, of course, the fuel, and, and the petroleum and gas industries, that they're probably a lost case by now, but from other industries that are going through very important um, business model changes. And I do think that has an important part to play in transition. Of course, regulation is super important. And of course, we have to get um, to a more progressive set of rules and of institutions that make sure that sustainability is a priority for everyone and not just for those companies 
to de who decide that it's a good business model for them. I, I'm completely aware of that, but I do think interesting and and progressive business models are one of are are, are one of the the issues that make this transition a lot quicker. And sometimes I think that if if we always decide that that business is the enemy we're probably not going to go about this transition as quickly as we could. Absolutely. I think Sunita has a point to make. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to get back uh, to uh, Gunter about this indeed, because we have seen the reaction from the, uh, the policymakers. So what would you tell them? What do you think are the key elements that need to change? How can governments contribute to change the environment in which these ideas, these innovation that is coming from the business sector can actually contribute to make an economy more sustainable? Not only those concrete examples, but how can we change? Is there regulation that we need to change? Do we need to create an, a, a better, um, a more suitable uh, business environment? What is it that we need to do at a global but also European uh, level to change the environment that, so that those businesses can grow? The first thing you need is to deliver on your promises. I mean, this is the drama. Is too many politicians don't deliver on promises. Big declarations and no action afterwards for all the excuses we know. So. I mean, let's look at the case of Italy, Milano. The city of Milano has the best recycling and has a total conversion of organic waste into compost, leading to Italy being a leader in composting technology. How was that possible? Well, because in cooperation with the private sector, first of all, they decided to impose bioplastics. Because if you don't have bioplastics, you never produce a compost of quality. And you know the problem with composting today, very great initiative, but too many microplastics in the compost means that it is of no value and can never generate the revenue. Milano was the first city that said, no, we will go quarter per quarter, uh, part of the city to part of the city, and we will show that if you're using bioplastics for your vegetables and your fruits, that you will be creating a compost of value without the microplastics. And that led to getting five times more revenue for the compost than the two or three euro per ton. They started getting 15 to 20 euro per ton. Now that made a big difference in the budget of the city, but it also made immediately available to the citizens compost and they realized that they were bringing not their plastics back to the farmland, but they were bringing their, their leftover food back to the farmland. You know, we need to ensure that there is delivery on the promise. And the delivery I know very well can take 10 years for a city of several million people, but you need to go where it is possible. Second, the government needs to stop thinking that it needs to subsidize. There is no cash anymore to subsidize. We need to maybe kickstart the process by having some partnerships, but the trick of continuing to pay for waste management, which is in the end paid by the citizens with their tax money, is not going to provide a solution. Let me just give you the case of an Asian city because we have no one from Asia here. The city of Busan, million inhabitants. Today, Pusan is self-sufficient in its uh, biogas thanks to the management of its organic wastes. A city of one million being self-sufficient. Now, that means not only that the city is not having to pay for these very expensive service providers who have usually three, five, ten-year-long contracts, they now have the cash to really invest in the very important social functions a city must uh, take responsibility for. But then the other beauty is that the city of Busan, thanks to this program, has reduced its carbon emissions by more than 40%, just by shifting the waste management. It is not only the methane gas that is eliminated from the landfills, it is just simply the biogas that is locally produced and locally consumed. And the third effect is, of course, that the cash now circulates in the local economy. And this is an amazing situation because once you buy gas energy locally, you have a kickstart in that local economy. 
and and i think politicians do not have sufficient understanding how an ecosystem works with plants and animals uh, with mushrooms and algae and bacteria the economy works the same way you have those who are in the bioplastics you have those in the energy sector you're those in the fruit and vegetable sector you know we need to see how the amalgamation of these different sectors creates new business models that permits the politicians to deliver on their promises but that means risk taking that is a risk and risk is something that today we know is something that is very hard to come by you know if you look at all the studies and all the analysis and how much money consultants get paid in order to make an analysis and an audit of an analysis and to chair a commission of a commission that verifies the analysis i mean we're wasting our time with having so many people look at it we have to be very pragmatic poor people cannot be asked to be patient and we need to deliver on their basic needs Absolutely, we need to deliver, but indeed, uh, it has a political price, right? And that's why some governments have been a little bit reluctant on moving forward, but luckily we're now on a different mindset and we are seeing a lot of changes at European and a global level in a push for a more sustainable economy. I wanted to get back to Sunita because you mentioned Aisha and we have her uh, in India. And I was wondering, how does she see the role of businesses in, these, uh, in this discussion, in this promotion of a more sustainable growth and how uh, civil society organizations can actually push not only for a more sustainable growth, but also to make sure that uh, the labor rights are respected, that human rights are respected, because when we talk about foreign companies uh, in third countries, often we face a very, uh, very ugly picture there. Now, thank you, Beatrice. And I, you know, in fact, when Carolina was speaking, I wanted to, um, uh, to add on to that point. Um, for me, the biggest challenge really is that we have to redefine what do we mean by private sector and business. And I think right now, our entire notion of private sector is a formalized private sector, which has very um, sort of, you know, integrated systems and hierarchies, and it is an established. The trouble with our world and the trouble with, uh, and in fact, the solution and the opportunity in our world, let me sort of rephrase it because I don't think it's a trouble. I think it's the opportunity in our world is that we have entrepreneurship, which is at a scale which is incredible. And that entrepreneurship needs to be uh, maximized in terms of how to use the private sector in the circular business we're talking about. Let me give you a clear example of what I'm talking about. Um, so I do a lot of work on excreta, on sewage. That's one of my, my most important areas of work, both in terms of water supply in a city, but also uh, the, uh, the outflow of the water supply, which is excreta. And we have been doing city by city in India and now for South Asia and Africa, what we call shit flow diagrams. Trying to understand where does the sewage from households go? As you know, 80% of the water we get into households leaves it as sewage. Now, what we are finding in our world is, and this is across South Asia, across Africa that we've done, uh, is that most of the sewage um, uh, is actually an on-site system, which means that people have a toilet and that toilet is connected either to a septic tank or connected to an underground tank, maybe not well built, or connected to some other local system. And this is because it's too expensive for our municipalities to invest in underground sewage systems and connect the massive populations we have across our cities. Now, instead of seeing this as a problem, we need to see this as a new opportunity. The fact is, there is massive number of private, and let's call, let's be very clear about it. This is private sector involved in collecting the sewage and then taking it and dumping it. They don't have a treatment plant right now. 
but they collect it from households. Now, the huge opportunity, uh, the mayor talked about the opportunity we have about reinventing mobility. Here is an opportunity to reinvent the sewage and uh, the water and sewage systems in our cities. Today, they are water intense. We treat the sewage, put it back into the rivers. But if we were to harness the private sector that exists in our cities, which actually collects the sewage from households, improves the technology with which they do it, build in better human rights conditions, labor conditions into them, but not formalize them, not create a multinational out of them, not create a formal entity, but find a way in which you can actually build cooperative systems in which the private sector, because they're competitive, they are the best organizers for our cities. So if we can do that, we can collect the list, we can take it to a treatment plant, and we can actually reuse the sewage that we have back on the land. Today, the treated affluent of all our modern cities goes into our rivers, which actually destroys the nitrogen cycle of the world. By doing land-based sewage management, you're restoring the nitrogen cycle of the world. You're putting back the phosphorus and nitrogen back onto the land. And you're creating a huge livelihood opportunity as well. So for me, the biggest idea is you have to reinvent what you mean by business. And you have to find a way in the small, the informal business, which is the best for our way of of uh, sustainability for the circular economy can survive in the equal. Is that part of the solution, indeed, Gunther? Do we need to redefine what businesses are and what the contribution to society is? You know, we have to come down to where was the idea of business coming from? And the idea of business was it was given a license to operate because it was a providing a service to community, to society. That's why it was protected from its excessive risk-taking and you had the limited capital contribution. So now we have apparently a business model where you're, you're protected from your own mistakes. <laughs> you know, this is quite amazing. Uh, we have to have a license for business to contribute to the common good. And that is not the case anymore. We now have a license of, to do business, to become cowboys in the world of capital and to generate massive profits for oneself, which you stick away in tax shelters. Even Europe is permitting large corporations to pay one or two percent on their profits whereas citizens have to pay 30, 40%. It doesn't make sense anymore. So we need to go back to what is the license to being in business. It is not unlimited profits without paying any taxes. That has to come back to a sense of reality. And I know this is very hard for politicians, but this means that we will not succeed in turning around the existing businesses. We will have to create a new generation of entrepreneurs and a new generation of entrepreneurs is what i see emerging all around the world um i was yesterday in croatia uh, where you know with a 35 percent unemployment in the old balkan war zones it is obvious that if you tell them do more and better of the same you will get out of trouble no they will not get out of trouble it's only when there is a sense of as Sunita said, resilience, a sense of community service, a sense of responding to the basic needs of everyone. Then we will be able to move on and we will be able to innovate, not only in technology, but we'll be able to innovate in the business models themselves. Absolutely. A lot of potential indeed for change. Um, I'm going to be a little bit controversial because you mentioned something that I think 
we might need to discuss. And it's a question of how do we make sure that those businesses are indeed contributing to the common good? Um, I was wondering, is it taxation maybe a way to push into a more circular economy, making sure that uh, the materials that are used are reusable and recyclable? Uh, it's, is that a way or is it a regulation? What do you think is a way forward for those businesses? And I think taxation is very inefficient and very often unfair. I'm not talking of the normal fiscality, but I, I'm green taxation. Because you can say plastic bottles will be, will be taxed, for example, or big cars or that, that kind of thing, but rich people will always be in a position to buy those things. And the other people will have to buy what they can buy, I mean, what they can afford. And in the, in the same time, the companies will keep producing those things which are very bad quality. So instead of saying, this is bad, but you can still produce it and then pay a tax. You say, this is bad, so you cannot produce it anymore. I mean, we, this is, or, or, or at least, and, and we should also stop, for example, advertising for, we should ban advertising for products which have negative consequences on, on, uh, on biodiversity and on, uh, and on uh, global warming, as we did for tobacco, for example. It, it was a long struggle, but in the end, everybody agrees, okay, we cannot ban tobacco, if, because if we ban tobacco, people will produce it, like, like <laughs> alcohol in the time of the prohibition so we know that in terms of social regulation it's better for some things that people will never quit if I may say to, to keep to, to leave them uh, legal in, in production and then tax them very highly and, and that's in, in, in that case but each time you can say we will replace this technology with a cleaner technology it's much better to say just stop producing it as, as we did with bulbs uh, 15 years ago and and we with, with, with and we have to do the same with cars and say well in, in within 10 years you cannot produce th thermic cars anymore and only electric cars will, will be produced in the same way the production of energy and that kind of thing so setting norms even for the industry is, is, is the best technology. You tell the industry, this is the standard today, this will be the standard in five, year, five years' time, in ten years' time, and then they have time to organize that transition and uh, to make sure that they will abide by the new standards and, and that we will replace the, the, the bad products by, with, with, with good products. So let's, let's forget this idea that uh, also the, the, those carbon credits, for example, all mm -hmm. those market mechanisms, they proved incredibly inefficient. I mean, it was a subsidy, I agree with Gunter, that we have to stop subsidize those companies and say, and say we, we, we don't have to subsidize them to be virtuous. We have to tell them, this is what you have to produce, point. Because uh, it was democratically, democratically decided to, to rescue the planet and to, and to create more uh, co social cohesion and to, uh, and to protect the biodiversity. It's much more efficient and it's much clearer. And many companies just ask for that. I mean, just, just tell us what we can do. Absolutely. And what, what is democratically decided and we will try to make profits, but where, where this is possible. I think you, you bring a very interesting point, which is the question on who is paying the price of the green transition, which is something that we have been discussing for a very long time and now is bringing back to the conversation indeed, because making sure that the transition is greener is also sometimes mean it's more expensive and then some people cannot afford uh, to buy bio products or they cannot afford to buy a, a car that would last longer and that it's uh, using uh, electric energy. So how do we make sure that we make the green transition affordable for everyone and uh, as, much, as much inclusive as possible? I would say in the question there lies something like the non-green transition also has, we have to be clear that non-transforming also has a social price. And this means it is the lower income people, the poorer people, they pay also the higher price on the negative effects on climate change. If you are in a, in a social housing complex with maybe no green area in front of you, of course, the, the, the impact of uh, climate change and on heat in urban areas is higher than if you live in your villa with a, a nice swimming pool. Mm. Uh, and uh, so we have to be clear, there is also now those who, who produce uh, emissions and uh, there is also a social division because it's the richer one would produce higher emissions than the poorer ones. And there is a price to be paid where the poorer ones pay a higher price than, than the richer ones. So this means also, when we want to have the climate change, of course, we have to look on the social impact. This is, is extremely important, uh, but we have to be clear, and I, I support uh, also Paul's point of view. We have to put clear lines. It's not only about thinking that the market economy with pricing all the negative impact can solve everything. I'm mm -hmm. in favor of a CO2 uh, uh, tax and these kind of issues, but we have to be clear. We have to put also limits in production and, and in use. But and this is, I think, extremely important, uh, we should not lead into a society where we say to the people, it's your 
responsibility alone in your behavior how the future will be. Okay. It is our individual responsibility, but also by taking collective decisions. Mm, absolutely. To, to, to become a vegan does not automatically change all the ways of production. So we have and collective decisions are much cheaper. I mean, if, if yeah. everyone changes a small thing in one's life, it's much more expensive globally than changing the regulation for, for everyone. And I think the question you mentioned is very important in terms of affordability, because affordability also means that the people who cannot afford very expensive goods will will think will, will support this green transition or not. They see, like like the yellow vests in, in, in Absolutely. France. If if they see it's something, well, this is not for me. They will be against it, and then they can support uh, the Donald Trump of this world and, and so on, who say, well, this is because of the wind the windmills, and uh, we should we should stick to coal and that sort of things. So it's very very important, not only in terms of uh, social fairness, but also in terms of efficiency, to make sure that every Every social group can can be integrated in, in this transition and their price mechanism is are very important why is uh, organic food uh, more expensive than uh, than uh, than normal food or mm. industrial food well, well because of trade on the one hand and 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 because of the cap here in Europe of the common agricultural policy we, we subsidize this industrial uh, this industrial uh, food industry instead of subsidizing the small farmers who not only produce crops but also also so preserve the, the environment so we set the rules which make some of those goods more expensive than they should be and we we have to change those rules and make sure that it is what is uh, healthy and safe that becomes uh, affordable but may maybe just uh, because you you mentioned long before the beginning of the debate on the the food in public hospitals public kindergartens and i think it's important to integrate their organic food yeah. for everybody and not only for let's say the rich private kindergarten where they have special pedagogic and special food. It is, we want to have best pedagogic and best quality food for, oh, uh, best quality food for, for everybody. So to have it normal. And then also like Gunther was saying, then you have an impact also on the circular economy. Absolutely. Then the production gets also higher on these issues. I was hearing that uh, Sunita and Karina were reacting very strongly about these words um, and about the need to uh, ensure that the green transition is more affordable and it's also uh, an in ensure social fairness. How do you think this affects uh, to uh, developing countries, Sunita? Are you there? Can Thank you, you hear Mike is off. Hello? I've unmuted myself. Hi, <laughs> okay. can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. Go ahead. I was saying that for us it's very clear. If something is not affordable, it is not sustainable. And it is very clear that we have, for instance, if you take the food system, and I think the point was very valid, say that we need a food system in which we actually incentivize and we pay for the labor of farmers and do not allow for uh, that labor of farmers, uh, the, the cost of water, the cost of land to be discounted because of the very large agribusinesses that we have in the world. And the processed food in today is completely local biodiversity, it's destroying the way people eat their food. Intensive food uh, cultivation in Europe in particular has huge uh, footprint um, um, in terms of uh, um, the food habits across the world. So I think it's important for us, and I think you've touched on some very important issues, but I think the policy needs to go deep enough so that you actually end up in the small businesses, particularly in the developing world, particularly in the world that requires resilience in its rural economies Absolutely. and I think that's the global trade system is so badly so badly uh, distorted uh, that it really needs to be worked upon Yes, of course, the question of trade, as you mentioned before, Paul, is absolutely relevant for these. And I know that you are uh, very strongly opposing some of the uh, trade agreements that the European Union has been negotiating over the past few years, precisely because of that impact that they might have in a more sustainable way of producing food, in particular in Europe. 
Yeah, it can be sometimes very, very absurd. And again, food is a very good example because we eat every day, but also because it's very easy to understand. But when, when we import soy from Brazil or, we, or palm oil from Indonesia to feed, uh, to feed the animals that we will eat here in, in Europe, I mean, we destroy the forest there, we destroy the local, uh, the local uh, carbon uh, uh, capture, and we destroy the jobs here too to produce a food which is not healthy for the people. I mean, it's completely absurd. So we should, I mean, and again, with this market, Mercosur agreement. I have nothing against uh, our good <laughs> friends from uh, from Latin America. I think we should we should strengthen the link between Latin America and, and Europe. Suddenly, but importing beef uh, from from extensive uh, production uh, in Brazil or Argentina uh, in peace, in places where the forest will be destroyed. I mean, this is something we can absolutely not accept. It is in terms of. Uh, uh, destruction of uh, biodiversity, of uh, those carbon, natural carbon uh, sequestration, absolutely unacceptable. And in the same time, it contributes to a distortion of the price mechanisms mm. on, on the food market. So, yes, we have to produce food here. And by producing food here and by using the subsidies that, because subsidies there will remain necessary if you want to make sure that everybody can have affordable food, at least for the forthcoming, uh, for the foreseeable future, then we should concentrate them on, uh, on those f small farmers who really have a positive contribution to the, to the balance of the planet. And as we were saying before, it doesn't make any sense really to have a more sustainable economy in Europe, to support local economies and then go and have trade agreements that actually are distorting completely the market in other countries and are contributing to climate change yeah. somewhere else, indeed. I wanted to bring back again Carolina on this one about the question of social fairness, about the impact of trade as well. How do you see from the perspective of a local government in an in a uh, evolving economy. So I, I think I was the one making faces because I think <laughs> these are very complex issues. Unfortunately, they don't have simple solutions. And, and I think the one important, really huge takeaway that I'm taking from Gunther's in, uh, participation is this is an ecosystem and we need big trees and small trees and we need fungi and we need we need everything we need a uh, participation and transitions from big businesses and small businesses we're not going to change the ecosystem through willpower and i think the problem with these talking points that tend to provide these really simple solutions are actually what um, sometimes makes the public feel so hopeless when these you know simple, practical, easy talking point solutions don't work because they don't. They're not going to work for climate change and they're not going to work for biodiversity. I know very little about trade, so I'm, I'm very hesitant to speak about it, but I do think uh, the conversation is being simplified into almost fiction. Not all countries have big palm oil, you know, biodiversity depleting industries, and not all of your trade agreements are going to have this impact. We have to be more careful, of course, how we trade and what kind of interest industries we're promoting. But climate justice is not a local issue. Climate justice is a global issue. And I'm very sure I disagree with the fact that there's a democratic choice on the global level that we have that we want to have this green and resilient future. You know, more than half of the world's population is tremendously poor and they're not as worried as we are <laughs> about technological transition. So we have to take this transition, you know, taking climate justice on a global level into account. Oh, this is a global system, not only through trade, but we saw it with COVID. We're all dependent on each other. And if we decide that we're gonna have these local solutions, we have to be very careful in terms of what we produce on the global stage. Because I do think if we're very immersed in either the climate policy world or the biodiversity policy world, we tend to put on shutters and not see the rest of the problem. We have the largest global crisis in the past century going on right now. Sunita started by mentioning the poor have become more impoverished. And what we're going to see over the next five to 10 years is people starving because our economies have come to a complete halt. And this can't be, you know, we can't think that we can just focus on climate change. That's not the way it's going to work. And the yellow vests are going to be a very small movement when compared to what can happen globally. We've had more than 50 days of social unrest in Bogota with people taking to the streets, initially because of a tax reform that was clearly badly planned out. But that, it, that wasn't the issue. Once the, the tax reform was dropped, people uh, continue to protest because the future looks bleak because there are very few opportunities on the horizon. 
And if we don't look at that while we look at sustainability, we're going to fail as a generation. We're going to fail tragically if we don't see it as a global climate justice agenda. Extremely powerful message from Carolina. Thank you so much because I think it was a very interesting and very important contribution that we needed for this debate because it's absolutely essential to make sure that citizens are part of the solution, that they're part of, uh, of this transition because otherwise we're going nowhere without citizens. This doesn't really make any sense. Um, I, we had a question uh, from uh, our social media about this, but in a, in a, in a very concrete manner. Um, and this question is coming from Dominic Falco from Luxembourg, and he's saying so due to the COVID pandemia uh, and its impact freight costs from Asia to Europe has been increased by 60 uh, uh, by 600 percent in one year and is still sourcing in Asia remains massively cheaper than to produce locally in Europe how concretely producing locally can be envisaged as an alternative and who will pay the price maybe Sunita you would like to jump on this one why so extremely cheap uh, to produce in Asia and how do we make sure that we move that production uh, into Europe to make sure it's locally produced and more sustainable without actually having a huge impact on the development of countries in other areas of the world? Well, it's, it's cheaper to produce in Asia when you discount the labor and the environmental costs, but that's also the livelihood opportunities that we have in our part of the world. And I think, you know, you can't fix these questions in Europe without fixing them globally. And I think what Catalina just said is so powerful and so right. You can't really now, we just think about it. We have created a free trade system in which we move production uh, to uh, parts of the world where production could be done much cheaper than, say, in a country like Europe. Now, today we are seeing the downside of that, where Europe, the cost of production is high, labor and employment obviously is becoming a major concern, and uh, but you have large parts of the world to be fitted and uh, connected to this global trading system where they have no other opportunity but to produce this, whether it is um, uh, palm oil or whether it is other products. So if we want to correct this, we are going to have to take some serious corrections, both at, in my world and in your world. And then we will have to do this together. I mean, in India, we are talking about how we need to create systems in which local producers um, get better value for their labor, for the opportunity that they create, but then the cost goes up. And as the cost goes up, they get uncompetitive with other parts of the world. So you, you have a race to the bottom. And I think that race to the bottom has to be stopped uh, only if we can actually work together in a truly interdependent world, which we are not doing. We are literally dog-eat-dog -dog world. In spite of COVID, in spite of climate change, we are not to coming together as a community of nations. Absolutely. Are we are we are we just forgetting that the policies that we uh, that we put together in Europe have an impact on the countries? And I am completely thinking now that Sunita mentioned this question about uh, the future carbon uh, border tax, which is going to have an impact on those countries, their countries that have way less progressive uh, uh, sustainable policies, and therefore they're going to see the products being way more expensive when they are imported in Europe. Are we taking into consideration the impact of those policies in third countries and how that can be? translated into a social unrest? Who should answer that question? Maybe you first. <laughs> um, well, I'm not a big fan of carbon tax. I think carbon tax should be used with very reluctant countries. When, but when we talk with countries which have taken pledges in, in the framework of the Paris Agreement and which uh, implement the pledges, there is no reason why you should tax them. Uh, you should also take into consideration, of course, the capacity of those countries to meet the standards that we Europeans uh, have set. Uh, but sometimes, I mean, if, if some very reluctant countries say, I don't want to, uh, to abide by those uh, standards and still I want to export my goods to Europe, then it becomes the right of Europe to say I will protect my, 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 my own producers and in the same time uh, make sure that uh, I will force or, or constrain those countries to go in the right direction. The good thing would be, would be to say then we use at least 50 persons of, the, of those incomes 
in, in the framework of, of, the, of the Green Fund and, and the support for the countries uh, which need global funds and which, which need the support of global justice, and I fully, fully agree with Carolina uh, here on, 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 those, on those issues, that we, should, we, rich countries, should contribute much more to those Green Funds to make sure that the transfer of technology, the support for mitigation and adaptation policies and the transition will be affordable for those countries too. But we can start by reducing some of the mechanisms like, for example, uh, again, uh, trade agreements that have negative impacts on those countries too. When, for example, we, we very long exported our surplus, milk surplus or chicken surplus to African countries, by doing that, uh, we, we, we simply made it impossible for those countries to develop their own production and, 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 to, and to be a, uh, and their own uh, food sovereignty, which is also a very important target for those uh, countries which are still struggling with, with poverty. So let's start with things when we can help those countries. Let's start by reducing the decisions that we have taken, which have mm -hmm. negative consequences on those countries. And then let's only use the constraining mechanisms if some reluctant countries really don't want Want, want to act as free riders. Absolutely. And we know that the European Union is actually making sure that they help their countries as well to implement the Paris Agreement goals. So it's part of the mm -hmm. uh, EU action uh, with our countries. We're getting close uh, to the end of this event. But before we leave, I want to give just maybe one very short moment to each of our speakers to answer one of the questions that we had from our audience and that I think is very much relevant and it touched upon everything that we have, we have been discussing today. So we have seen that because of the COVID crisis, we have seen the mass Massive impact both in terms of seeing the nature healing but also where economies shrink and I was wondering whether you think that this is going to be translated into a shift on the way in which we consume the way we do business is that we're going to see a real change in the way we do our economy what do you think Andreas I think it is not so much about predicting the future it's much more about what needs to be done and simply we cannot continue like we do now uh, we have to change our trade system. I'm, I want to insist also on this point because it has a lot of negative impact. We have to go back and value some things uh, higher than we do value globally now, like human labor, because we accept with our trade system a lot of slavery labor, child labor and, and other issues. And of course, we, we are convinced that the labor and the, the has, has to have a, a high price. So. It is fair and also it does not make a harm to the economy or to the, to the development. Uh, secondly, of course, we have to think on local solutions like on food, we discussed very, very much. Uh, and we, ha we have to, to, to change uh, our behaviors on this. So, uh, but we have to be clear, it is, everything has a social impact. So speaking about climate, we need first also speak about social justice. This goes together in, in, in my, my opinion. So, we have to change in order to react on these uh, big issues and we have not, not very much time left. So in Europe, at least, we, st we started to put the, the goals like uh, 2040 to be climate neutral, uh, 2030 uh, already reduced uh, to a high percentage, but we on. have to, to implement <laughs> it also. It is good to put goals, but it's also necessary to implement and probably this is wow. an issue where Europe cannot go alone. Absolutely. Sunita, what do you think? Are we in the wake of an actual change or are we going back to business to, as usual? Well, I think we're at a very critical time. And I think, um, as Carolina said, that we're at a time when we are going to see massive impoverishment of very large numbers of people. Economies are going to go back uh, by many years, a decade, because of the COVID crisis. Um, on the other hand, we have to rebuild. And I think that's where the opportunity is. If we can think today in terms of how we can rebuild in a way that we can build the resilient local economy. In my world, I ha we have seen massive numbers of people going back to rural areas. Now, India has a very powerful scheme where we invest uh, the government pays for creating employment and that employment is used for building ecological assets. If we can do this at a scale so that we can invest in rural economies, we can build for local economies and we can use this 
but we will have to pump in very large amount of social in, in terms of money to put it in the hands of the poor. That is critical for us in the years to come. The point is, can we use that money which we put into the hands of the poor for building um, an ecological security for the future? That's one option. The other is that in urban areas we have seen, because of this massive migration out of cities, because the urban poor basically found that the cities had turned their backs on them, that they do not have good housing, they do not have good water or sanitation or labor conditions. There is an opportunity here as well where you pay for higher cost for the labor back in the cities. You build for affordable housing. You build livability in the cities, keeping in mind the labor that is needed for the industrial growth. But that means the cost of production will go up. And as the cost of production goes up, and that's the big issue, can we make sure that we can become a society where we can pay the cost of production into the hands of very poor people and yet have the consuming tasks of the world not create a problem to say that the cost has gone up, the cost of food has gone up, the cost of living has gone up, because we need to be able to create a system in which the producers of the world and the environment of is actually paid for, and those costs are not discounted. Build, and that's the opportunity going forward. Build a more sustainable, also fair society. Thank you so much, Sunita. Carolina, very quickly, do you see us going forward into a real change of perspective of behavior into a more sustainable world? I'm, I'm going to just quickly uh, affirm everything just Sunita said, because <laughs> I think, I mean, it's very dangerous to base economic recovery on public employment and public investment. We have to get the private sector on board and, and you know, everything she said. But I, I do have equal measures of, of hope and worry. I do think uh, the post-COVID world and the fact that it's joined by this sort of evolved consciousness around the climate change, uh, crisis is going to allow us to have sort of a modified uh, version of what success means. I do think there's sort of a, and this sounds a little bit uh, hippie-ish, but I do think there's a global sort of change of consciousness in terms of what a successful country is, what a successful person is. I do think there's a shift there that is very hopeful, but I am a little bit worried about um, politics and in general decision-making in the era of social media because things have to be so simplified. And what we need is these extremely, you know, complex, multi-sectoral um, solutions to these problems. But what we're getting from decision makers more and more is oversimplified uh, solutions that seem simple but are really hard. So, I mean, in equal measures, I do think I'm hopeful <laughs> in terms of uh, global consciousness. But I think as a public, uh, we have to strengthen our democracies to accept complexity as, as something desirable and not as something punishable. Let's hope for the best indeed. What do you have to say, Paul? What do you think? Well, I, I think first, as Churchill said, optimism is moral duty. So we <laughs> have to be optimistic, otherwise we will never find the political energy to, uh, we need for this transition. I see quite positive signs those last month. First, the European Green Deal was important. The first continent to say we want to be carbon neutral before 2050. Second, the US came back in the Paris Agreement. China took very important commitments. Uh, international organizations such as the International Energy Agency saying now we have to get rid of fossil fuels. It's like a fox saying we have to stop <laughs> eating chickens. So it's, it's, I mean, it's quite an important signal. Uh, when you see Shell in the Netherlands condemned by the courts, uh, thanks to the mobilization of the civil society, I'm not saying that, okay, we're there, but these are an, a number of very important structural change here in this part of the world, I'm not talking of the rest of the world, but at least in this part of the world, in, in those uh, very industrial and very rich countries, which, I mean, for the first time since 10 years ago or so, uh, tends to, we, we can think that maybe we are very close to, to a major change, but we have to keep putting a lot of pressure when you see at the same time that 
within the European uh, Union, we are not unable to change the, the common agricultural policy, for example, as it should be changed. It also shows that resistance and conservatism remains very strong. So we have what, to keep fighting. Hard. Of course, indeed, very positive messages coming uh, from our speakers today and a lot of ideas to make sure that we move into a more sustainable world. Thank you so much for following this debate today. Thank you so much to our speakers for being here today with us and sharing their ideas, their thoughts and their initiatives uh, from their part of the world. And thank you. Uh, before we leave, I want to recall you that the next webinar in the context of the Global Progressive Forum will be on the 9th of September, same time, 2 to 3.30 p.m. Brussels times, and it will be social networks, allies or enemies of democracy. See you soon.